I very much improvised my way into film journalism. I'd had a huge passion for film since I was a kid, so you know I was one of these kids who I didn't just watch movies. I'd then write my little list of who was in it, and you know just be you know watch them over and over again. And I guess as I got older, it was like oh you start to recognise I like this film and this film, and the same person's name is on it, and you know getting to understand directors and things. So because I had this huge interest in it, and I always enjoyed writing. I started just for myself writing about stuff and I, st I did a film and literature degree at Warwick University which is actually all very theoretical, it's not very practical but you're again expressing your ideas you know in a written form about film and that's obviously quite academic and quite hard you know quite heavy going um, but it, it just sort of sustained my interest in writing about film something that I was really uh, I really loved I then, when I, when I, my first jobs were in TV, so they weren't really connected, and I just got very disillusioned with the stuff I was doing, I went and lived abroad, and I just kept writing my own bits and pieces. I fell in with the, the Rain Dance Film Festival, who had a, um, a sort of, like a zine, an in-house magazine that they, they sent out to their members, and I started writing for and then editing that, and my one, one piece of like savvy, <laughs> business, uh, um, let me say that again, I guess when I, st when I was writing for Rain Dance, the one savvy thing I did is I called up all the film magazine editors and said, I, for my little magazine, I want to do a piece on why don't British film magazines cover British films. So I went and interviewed Nick James at Sight and Sound and the then M editors of Empire, Total Film, I think it was Hot Dog at the time, and wrote a piece, sent it off to all these people. And obviously within the Rain Dance magazine, I was also um, writing and I would send that to people and the stuff got noticed from that. And so I started to get very small writing gigs from those magazines, mainly t Total Film and Hot Dog and stuff. And it just went from there. And I mean, as I think many people would probably testify, you start with small bits, maybe DVD review here or whatever. And if people are interested in what you're doing, you might get, you know, a bigger film review or an interview and stuff. And it just spread. I mean, it took a little while, but, you know, after a while I was writing for uh, different film magazines, uh, different websites, eventually some, you know, lifestyle magazines and newspapers. And that's really where it's up. So it kind of, I, I no training in journalism per se, no sort of, you know, academic background in terms of writing because the film literature course you know is it's not teaching you how to write you know reviews and things as such but it was just like I've always loved this stuff you know I want to sort of express my enthusiasm and my interest about it and uh, that's really where it started I guess I mean, the whole term critic is, is an interesting one because obviously in its kind of broadest sense it is about analysis and you know trying to explain and educate and you know analyze something film or any other form Obviously, it's also got the pejorative term, and I think, therefore, people often just assume critic is out to criticise and therefore is just, you know, kind of looking to, to find fault. So I think there's a, there's a school of thought, especially because a lot of the, the movies that are most popular are not necessarily the ones that, you know, come at the top of the sight and sound best of, you know, the year. So in, I guess, the mainstream, there's definitely an idea that the, the critics are not, you know, reflecting popular taste, and therefore they're not. They're maybe not necessarily irrelevant, but they're certainly they're, they're, there's a disconnect between what people are actually going to see and kind of voting for, if you like, with their money, and what people are recommending as a sort of, you know, the best of its art form. Ultimately, critics and people who you know have a background in and you know sort of an experience of being able to properly analyse, uh, you know, an art form, whether it's film, music, whatever, they are looking at it often in a different way to people who, for it, certainly in film, often, and it's a common, you know, sort of argument, is I just want to be entertained. I'm not interested in some sort of deep underlying, you know, social meaning or, you know, some artistic thing. It's like, did it make me laugh? Did it make me cry? Did it entertain me? Did, I, did it scare me if it's a horror movie? And... Those are, you know, valid responses. But I think if you're if you're dealing with an art form, then you also and you and you're interested in it, then you also want to be looking at it. How is it best expressing the potential of that art form? 
and that to me is what a critic or someone who's writing or you know analyzing film should be doing they should be saying yes it was funny yes it was uh you know entertaining or or scary but here's why it may have had those effects on you and there are films that can actually have some of those effects that are not necessarily the most sophisticated uh you know ways of producing that but then there are also films that have you know can can provide those uh, those effects but they're they're working in a different way and hopefully people also appreciate those but then they may be if you're interested the whole thing is how much interest do you have in something there's nothing wrong with listening to a piece of music and singing along to it and thinking this is fantastic but then if you're actually interested in how was that put together knowing how the notes are put together or what effects are on it or what instrumentation and the arrangement so it's it's really a degree of how interested in the subject you are and I think there are always people who are interested in knowing a little bit more and that's where good criticism or good analysis comes in because you want people who know what they're talking about to be able to help elucidate and enlighten on what is going on in some of those areas and also I mean this is the other thing it should also be a personal response you know it would be actually quite boring if somebody if a, you know a, a film critic is just going you know this is a close -up. the reason this worked is because you you zoom in and it's you know augmenting the face and stuff I also want to hear someone's personal reaction why you know what response that provided why they thought that was interesting so you've got a kind of you know there's an objective idea of this is why this is working and then for me at least I want to know why it had that effect on this audience member because if it's if, if art is anything it has to be able to create a connection between the individual viewer listener reader and the the pieces that they're viewing listening or reading I would say any art critic is really there to take a piece of work unpack it in terms of you know obviously there's an idea of for somebody who doesn't know anything about it this is what it's about this is you know the structure the story everything and then it's really about how is this piece you know put together and is it achieving the effects that it's hoping for or is it achieving them in a way that kind of feels like there's a rigor behind it there's an you know there's a bit of intelligence behind it because I mean you know George Lucas was famous for saying you know I can make anyone cry you know put a bag of kittens in a canal or whatever and he's obviously saying but I don't want to do that I have nobler ambitions and you know whether he did whether he succeeded is a whole other matter but there are shortcuts emotional shortcuts to get people to cry to scream to laugh but I would say one of the roles of criti a film critic, if we're talking about film, is to, is to identify when people are actually being a bit smarter how about how they're going about that. And to acknowledge when something is just innovative or imaginative and try as best as possible because you're writing about an audiovisual thing, which is, you know... It's not there's an argument of how relevant is writing about something like that writing about music you know it's it, these are these are kind of maybe not the best ways to go about it but it's what we have it's communication so you've got to kind of elucidate on what is going on and then i do think there's a very important idea of you have to also put that across in an interesting and hopefully entertaining way you know I am, uh, there are plenty of people who are very, very smart and can tell you why a film is good, but the way they do it might be really not very interesting. There are plenty of great writers, and certainly in the film world, very entertaining writers, but if you really read them carefully, you know that they're not necessarily the most learned, let's say. You know, they're not the people who have the biggest, widest range of you know, experience of cinema. So to me the best critics combine the two they know what they're talking about and they can put it across in a way that makes me what I'm looking for when I read a review is I want to see I don't just want it to find oh this is this is a good piece of writing I want to be able to look at that film maybe if I have I, I try to read after I've seen because obviously there's a whole argument that you know you find out way too much in advance but if I have seen a film and I then read about it for me, a good piece of criticism makes me think about it in a different way or highlight something that I haven't necessarily... Maybe I, I just haven't articulated. It was something I was thinking about, it stirred something up, but they have nailed it. They've made me think, yes, that's what I was trying to sort of come to as an idea. Or even if I disagree, it's like, that's interesting. They've again made me look at it in a different way 
I may not have the same conclusion, but they're making me look at art in a way that clues me into, they know what they're talking about, and they've got a, an interesting perspective on it. I mean, if I'm brutally honest, depending on who I'm writing for, there are different ways of writing. You know, if I'm writing for something that is not necessarily academic, but it's certainly, you know, it's, it's pitched in that sort of area, I, I, you know, there is definitely a, a different way of writing to something that is much more kind of mainstream and is the reference. You know, you can put in lots of references, but actually if the vast majority of those are not going to be, it's going to be harder for people to connect to, you have to question, am I just writing this to show my knowledge of, you know, so many films? I think there's I do I do think there's a way to blend it you know you can I've often read pieces where I've there's a reference from the writer and I go I don't really know who that is but then I'll, nowadays especially with the internet you can very quickly go and see what they mean so I think there's a way to do it that you're not dumbing down and you're not talking down to people but you know having studied film myself that sort of writing it's really you really question how relevant it is in the wider outside of it, its academic circles because it's so embedded in a sort of a language and a frame of reference that is so specialized it's like well how is that how are you going if you if you've got something interesting to say how are you not going to put people off if they immediately are like i don't know what that means i don't know what that, who is that what's that about so i think there's a way to kind of show that you know what you're talking about and refer to things that are relevant but not you know kind of overdo it that people feel a bit intimidated or a bit lost so to go back to your question because I do ramble <laughs> a lot, um, I think the different type you know somebody who's writing for I don't know uh, a, a kind of glossy magazine where you've got 50 words to describe you know the latest releases it's obviously a different type of writing to where you've got a much bigger you know space to express your ideas in and it's maybe for people who are looking at, at film in a different way so you've got to I think you've got to be aware of those things I don't agree with like dumbing down but I do think you just got to be smart about well how, if you want to get people interested what's the best way to do that and sometimes if you try and sort of you know put, oh well of course this is this shot is a reference to you know something something then you can actually lose people before you know you can have the adverse effect you know you're trying to you're trying to reach out and communicate to people and you can I have this myself if it's something with science I'm not particularly you know smart in that respect so if I read something that's heavily heavily you know related to the different theories it's actually going to push me away whereas someone who can explain it in a way that is not dumb but is actually going this is how we can get into this that that's a pathway in and I think that's what I'm big for me it's it's you know to sum it up it's all about connection you want to connect with a reader of your work and the film and it's this relationship that you're trying to do and ultimately you have to step out because it's then that person with their relationship with that film but if you can do anything if you can put them in a way to make them look at it in a different way or feel something that they hadn't quite been able to articulate themselves that's a good job you want to if if you want to really you know get into it you need to go into the, the the body of the of the the ingredients as it were but you also have to again you just have to recognize what other people are, are using film and film reviews for and a lot of people literally want what's the best thing that's open this week how can i quickly identify that you know or i'm looking for a good comedy oh this has got three stars this has got one star maybe that's more interesting Obviously, as someone who's very interested in not just, you know, film, but how they're put together, you know, a star rating is kind of like you put it on grudgingly if you have to. Because actually, I would hope that I'm writing about it interestingly enough that you're going to read that and that's where I'm expressing my ideas. The vast majority of outlets want some kind of summary rating, whether it's a star, whether it's a number, whether it's a letter. And so inevitably, more often than not, you have to sort of provide that and I mean, I'm sure other people have talked about this. So often you then read the comments to your review and it's like, I can't believe that guy gave it an 8.3. It's easily an 8.5. You're like, and I've sometimes written back, explain to me what the difference between an 8. It's, you know, this, and this is when it gets, it becomes a distraction rather than something to help. And I think, unfortunately, it's just the way it will go. So it, yeah, if I had my way, you know, some of the, pl the places that I read and enjoy, 
there's no star ratings but I totally understand that I'm not necessarily looking at it in the way that other people would and therefore it can be a very useful quick way to kind of hook people in I mean if I like a film if I put an A on it or a 4 or a 5 star and someone thinks oh let's go and see you know that, that person likes that film then maybe they'll read it when you're a three star out of four is different to a three star out of five. But then is a three star out of four a three and a half out of five or a four out of five? And you get into this ridiculous kind of semantics of like, what actually am I trying to grade this on? And that can be very tricky. And you end up sometimes giving uh, not the best reflection of what you actually wanted to say by the rating. Your review is saying something, and I've, I've had this in the past where from that review there's no way that should have been a four, three stars it's like yeah you might be right there actually because the review is what I really want to say about it and then trying to fix the right you know star thing on the top can be very tricky I think it's almost uh, you know for unless for a very, and I think this is reflected in, in industry and you know commerce in general a very few people do very well and actually very well in film journalism this is relative it's no one I don't think anyone's in this for the money but everybody else is then scrabbling around for scraps and that is definitely you know a, a wider world problem but within journalism and certainly within arts journalism and then specifically film journalism it is increasingly hard every year I would say to make a viable living at it to, to the point that like I say unless you're those select few it's almost impossible and depending on where you live certainly if you're based in London where you know house prices you know travel and stuff can be a ma major major expenses it is kind of crazy but you know this is not this this is nothing exclusive this is teachers this is nurses i mean you know the actual living wage thing is a is a wider wider world problem but if, you know to to kind of bring it down to film journalism since i've been doing it it's gotten progressively harder every year to make a living at it before the internet came out and content and I hate the word but let's just use it because that's yeah. that's the term that's used content was not free you like you wanted to read about something you bought that newspaper that magazine you know you had to make a small investment to find out that information nowadays that isn't the case and the people who have tried to sort of keep that model going have really struggled so therefore if people are not prepared or not having to pay for the content to produce that content is exponentially harder therefore cause and effect to pay people to write that content is harder and therefore it's just this you know it's this escalating or what's the opposite of escalating <laughs> it's, you know decreasing it, it basically it's going down shit creek i mean you know there is no sustainable model for where this is going if everything is free now I'm a big believer in information being free as well. So this is a real paradox because, you know, you are effectively, you know, shooting yourself in the foot if you want to make a living at being one of the people who's writing about this stuff. Because, and there's a whole generation now, probably now, <laughs> even coming up for two, they are not used to having to pay for this stuff. And that goes for everything. That goes for downloading movies, you know, music. And it's just a new way of consuming or processing stuff that it's just not expected anymore. The bottom line is, and you know, they've had huge discussions with this in music as well. It's like, well, hang on, if I'm, you know, producing music for you and you like it and you're not paying me for doing that, how do I keep making that music? And it's the same thing in criticism. It's like, there are, you know, the places that pay, pay less. The places, the places that pay, there are fewer of them. And so, to as I, you know, go back to the thing, to sustain a viable living, doing that exclusively, is just very, very difficult. Okay. Power and influence and money goes towards progressively towards you know, a fewer, smaller, you know, let me call it elite. I mean, that's a bit crazy to call film criticism because everyone's scraping by. But it get concentrated, and the few people who are in those positions who have done well or who are good enough, they will get paid. And everybody else, as I say, is fighting for scraps and. Yeah, I think it almost becomes like you need another job, and if you can do a bit of film writing on the side, good for you. Talk about the distinctions between other ways of doing film criticism, but written film criticism is just, yeah, I don't think it's a sustainable thing for a wide. The number of people who can do it as a living compared to previously is going to plummet, has plummeted. Obviously, there are more and more outlets, but a lot of those you know even websites and things are the obvious examples or blogs 
you know a few of those will get you know will will be able to monetize their you know their work and everybody else will do it for the love of it and i think this is where they've got people over a bit of a barrel because people do this because they love it they love films and it's it would be the same for a music journalist or you know an art journalist you do it because it's something you've got a huge passion for and you want to express your enthusiasm your ideas your you know things things that you think are wrong with with what's going on um and people are counting on that because you will keep going unless you literally are unable to or you financially cannot and so i guess you know people are finding other ways to make a living and then still doing this and those sites are then saying yeah thanks i'll keep you know yeah well it's great some more content fantastic i mean i had a this crazy thing a couple of years ago i went to can and i wanted to get more stuff in print because the way it works out there is the more coverage you get the better access you will get in future years and because i was doing some stuff for paid work there was another website uh, that i was going to do a bit for and i said how about i will do you a daily report or you know every other day like regular sort of updates on what's going on for free and they couldn't be bothered to actually upload content so that no it's okay so when you get into a point where you're you know, I wasn't just sacrificing myself. I'd had something. But, you know, I was doing it for my own gain, obviously. But it was also, hopefully, would have provided something. And when you get to the point where people can't even be bothered to upload stuff that you're giving them for free, then you do really question where things are going. I mean, this whole professional versus amateur thing is a very thorny issue because there are lots of, you know, professional critics who you know, you may disagree with a lot, who actually certain genres of film, this is, it's very prevalent around genres, they are just not into them, or they don't know much about them. And I would argue there are a lot of great writers and sites that focus on a particular thing, and it's obviously usually things that are, you know, get young, generally, and not exclusively, men excited, like sci-fi or horror or whatever. And you can find some very, very good writing from people who are just they were fans they start out this is where i mean harry knowles is the classic example right ain't it cool that was a revolutionary site in terms of here's a guy he absolutely set himself up as a fan but he managed to get enough attention and interest to basically you know suddenly be with the people that he was writing about and you know getting embedded and i think the whole so I'm not, you know, it's not like professional good, amateur bad. There's some great writing from both sides. I think the thing that I've noticed, which I do find slightly alarming, is what the movie industry has done is it's co-opted a lot of those people into their marketing and publicity. So a lot of the sites, and, you know, it's a bit derisory to say it, but just as a broad stroke, to call it fanboy sites in general, and because I've, I've done this, I've been with these people on junkets, they will fly these people all over the world to the film sets, give them amazing, ridiculous access to the big stars and the big directors because those sites will literally write anything about those movies. And they will not just write what has happened, it's like, who might be cast in this? What we might expect from this sequel or whatever. And they are doing those movie studios' jobs for them in a way that those people couldn't even do because they're not as versed in that whole world of whether it's superheroes, sci-fi, horror, whatever. And I think this is a very worrying trend because they are not journalists. They are very passionate, sometimes very articulate, but they literally are just after anything that will put them very close to the thing that they love and share it because this is the thing. There's a reason those sites get hits. There's a lot of people also interested in who might be the next Doctor Strange or Ant-Man or whatever. So they are fulfilling a need, but it is absolutely distorting the idea of film writing, journalism, criticism, because they have become embedded, you know? And, you know, having been sort of, you know, on the outskirts of that and sometimes even dipped into it, you see how that happens on these junkets. And it is nothing for a big studio to pay you know, what they get, the bang for their buck to pay some, you know, young guy to go out and sit next to Sylvester Stallone on the latest thing or whatever and then do a series of reports about it and then talk about any little thing that comes down the pipeline. And more to the point, these pieces are often vetted. You know, I mean, I've been there where you've written a piece 
it goes to approval. Now, this is now not actual journalism anymore. This is basically you are part of the publicity and marketing machine. Now, as long as you're happy to be open about that, fine, because you are fulfilling some kind of need out there that people are interested in. They want to know this stuff. They want to hear the speculation and, you know, any tidbits and rumors and set photos and all this stuff. But you are no longer doing what the original idea is, which is reporting objectively, criticizing, you know, analyzing and stuff. You are basically become part of the whole thing. And that's where, sadly, part of the future is going. Because you will, you know, people will actually make a living at that. Some of these guys I know who run these websites, they're starting to get advertising and money because they're there at every Comic Con, every, you know, every film set they can get to, every junket. They know the stuff. I mean, you see them, they'll meet Jason Statham. Hey, how's it going? Because they've, not, they've interviewed him five times this year, you know? And this whole distance, you know, analytical, you know, objective distance is out the window. Now, it doesn't mean they can't also write well and objectively, but the whole dynamic has shifted. And I think this is, this is an area that really needs to be looked at because you're not doing, you're doing a different role now. You are really, and I do mean this, you are really part of the producer's arsenal of uh, ways to get attention. I mean, in terms of uh, new media and the internet, there's two things that I think are really positive. The first is that when I'm writing stuff, I, I, you know, and it, it may sound a bit worthy or, you know, a bit kind of like to over noble, but it really is about connection and the way that now you can connect with readers and it's not always complimentary but you can really have an ongoing dialogue or discussion and that is something of course it was possible in the days of you know magazines and newspapers but it was so much harder and now it's so much more direct you can write a piece people write something about it and you can then choose or not to engage in an ongoing discussion about it. Now, of course, you know, comment sections are notorious for abuse and just, you know, stuff that's tossed off, uh, you know, without a lot of thought. But what I'm interested in, and I have, you know, I do do this a lot, is follow up with people who are actually, they want to talk about something a bit more. That is great. And the internet has absolutely facilitated that and made that so much easier. And, you know, this whole community idea, you know, it really enables that. It's something that absolutely it lends itself towards because people can gravitate towards that. They can share stuff, links, all of that thing. So that side of it, I find uh, really, you know, fantastic. And it's something that didn't really exist, certainly not in the form that it does now. The other thing is multimedia and, you know, obviously internet speed and, and things like that. As soon as you're able to download or stream and watch stuff, without it being, you know, an ongoing struggle of, you know, stopping and starting. The idea that I had was, and it makes it, sorry, let me say that again, my idea. <laughs> um, once the internet had the speed that people can stream and download and watch stuff without it being too, too much of a chore, there was so much more opportunity to make audiovisual pieces of film criticism. So one of the things that myself and many other people who have you know, been doing it far longer than me doing are video essays. Or, you know, you can also call them supercuts. There's a whole range of ways. But it's basically talking about film by using film clips. Or, you know, some people put themselves in it in the way that you know, some documentary makers put themselves in their documentaries. Some people use voiceover. But it's basically the way, for me, I can just talk about myself personally. For me, it's a continuation of film journalism in I would argue a more in for me personally a more interesting way because rather than write about the way the Coen brothers you know torment their male characters I can actually put a compilation together that shows that happening and it's almost like it's more direct in the way that people are then seeing the exact examples but I also feel I've had a uh, you know a journalistic input into that because I'm obviously compiling that and putting it and structuring it in a way that hopefully is again interesting entertaining makes people think about stuff or whatever um, and I think it's, it's kind of a no-brainer when you're talking about film which is audio and visual stuff if you can express that through audio and visual means that can be a big plus so I see that as a real step forward and you know there's, there's a whole you know world that exists of people making fan you know fan 
I mean, I guess it started with fan fiction, but you know, now you know, just showing things that they love about their favorite Scorsese movie or whatever. But you take that to a slightly more, you know, what's the right word? Rigorous idea where you're expressing, you know, critical ideas and journalistic ideas, and I think that's the way forward. And there are some phenomenal, phenomenal video essays out there made by people who really specialize in this stuff and they have made me appreciate you know in the way that a great piece of film writing has done they've made me look at a film or a body of work or an actor or a director in another way by the way that they have put those pieces together and i mean i can name names if you like but there are there are some f fantastic video essayists out there who you know i aspire to and in the way that you know if you're a writer you think oh that critic i wish i could you know that's the person i think is really good it's exactly the same for the video essay guys uh, and women who are doing it and i think the internet and new media in general totally lends itself towards that and i think it's the way forward on a personal note that has absolutely reinvigorated my interest in film journalism because it's allowed me um, a new way to sort of express myself creatively but also to get people interested I mean just as a, one example the very first video essay I did was on um, breaking the fourth wall so m films that acknowledge that they're films and I won't bore you with the details but it eventually went online and the responses I got to that were, I mean, quadruple, ten, ten times more than any written piece I've ever done. And it sparked dialogues, people were sending me clips, you know, oh, what about this film, what, you know, that film? And I recently made a sequel to that video essay, and I, the clips that other people recommended, in the credits, I credited those people and made sure that they knew that they were included in that because that was an absolutely perfect example for me of an ongoing dialogue about an aspect of film that I found interesting, obviously a lot of other people found interesting, and in a, in a way they also then contributed. I mean, there were obviously films that they said, what about this, which I knew of. There were quite a few that I just didn't know. And were like, wow, you've totally, you know, enlightened me on something, and now I can feed that back into the next thing I make, and then maybe you watch it. And so that element of where journalism and film criticism might go, that I find really, really interesting and really, you know, exciting. The, the, the classic sort of, you know, white, male, middle class, middle aged uh, film critic is <laughs> kind of stands up if you go to any press screenings in London. That said, there is a very good history of uh, very highly respected and very influential female film critics. So, you know, whether it's Pauline Kael, Molly Haskell, over here, Dillis Powell, you know, Margaret Hinksman, there is, there, there has been historically some quite high profile i'm sure not enough absolutely but it's not like this has been a boys only club i think nowadays like with any of these things there is more opportunity but you know whether organizations or or outlets are more resistant to certain new voices i, I honestly couldn't say but i think there's certainly more opportunity that said it is really disappointing i was in the press room at can and there's you know i don't know how many thousand journalists you really, on maybe a couple of hands, could count the number of faces that were not, you know, Caucasian. Yeah. And that is worrying, because these opportunities have actually existed for a while now. So why is that not, you know, being represented? You know, how many Asian or black film critics in the UK are there? Are there any? You know, there's very, very small numbers. And given the ethnic makeup of the UK nowadays, and certainly younger generations, you do have to question why that isn't reflected to a greater extent. Um, people have all sorts of hypotheses on why that is the case. But the opportunities are certainly there. But then it also needs, it's not just like, hey, I'm a writer of a different, you know, ethnic background. Somebody needs to give, the, the people who are in charge of giving the, you know, opportunities to anybody need to recognize that. So... It is, you know, I mean, the Cannes press room is really quite scary in that respect. It's like, when you think that there are journalists from supposedly the entire world, you would absolutely not see that if you just looked. And of course, you know, lots of countries can be very, you know, different ethnic looks as well. So it's not, it, it, that's a very broad um, statement, but it certainly is not evident. I mean, you know, my, my favourite film critic is an is a American guy called Wesley Morris, black American guy, he won the Pulitzer a couple of years ago. And... I actually went and had a chat to him in Cannes. He was easy to find him. <laughs> it's like, literally, I, no joke. It's like, he sticks out unbelievably there. And that's great. I mean, he's a fantastic writer. But I can't believe 
he's the only good writer you know of his ethnic background and so why are there not more of those you know men and women you know in the the one big environment for world film press i would love to be able to come up with a great model for how you can make film criticism a viable living for more people i just don't know that it exists anymore and that's a real shame because you do need people who have a broad you know knowledge and experience of film to be out there writing and i think that is really hard to encourage nowadays if you know that there's actually very unlikely to be a career in that you know then it becomes this hobby thing it becomes yes i do love film and i do know a lot about film but how much time am i actually you know like anything you know practice is is the important thing and you know you get better hopefully the more you do of it and i do worry that you know, people who are naturally good writers or naturally very, you know, smart people about film, ju there's just not the incentive anymore to kind of pursue that as a, as a career, you know, for the greater good, you know, to, we want more people who are better writers and better, you know, film you know, experts out there. And it's like, if you look at, well, am I even going to have a job at the end of this? It's so much harder nowadays.